Hi, my name is Keenan. And I'm Dominique. And you're listening to Saving Lives with Drones. Drones. This is episode number three. Thres. It is Thanksgiving week. Whew, you ready for some good food? I am ready. There's going to be turkey and hopefully it's going to be smoked and I'm going to be very happy about this. Yeah. Got my workout regimen to burn off all these pounds I'm going to add? I don't. Sorry. I, uh, don't be sorry. I just, <laughs> I just, me and working out is just not... You know, I, I my girlish figure relatively stays the way it is, so yeah. I'm, I'm see, good. I just pack the pounds on, as you can see. Yeah, I can tell. You need to lose a little weight there, buddy. Oh, sorry. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're probably in better shape than I am. So, this episode, what are we talking about today? We are going to talk about Part 107 versus Public Coa. Wow, this is a hot topic. Very, very, very hot topic, and a very important topic. It is. It is a very important topic. Well, very important topic. So let's talk about what we're talking about with Part 107 on public COAs. In the world of the FAA, there are two ways mm-hmm. that a public agency can get authorization to fly an unmanned okay. aircraft. Right. They can either go the public COA route, which okay. basically gives them a certificate of authorization that says you're going to follow these rules that we agreed upon between yourself and the FAA okay. that you're going to follow, and you go down that route. You self-certify. Typically, mm. they tell you like specific things that you can can't do. So, like for instance, they have two different types of public calls. One's called a jurisdictional. Mm. One's called uh, one's a blanket, and a blanket basically allows you to fly wherever you want to fly, mm-hmm. but it doesn't give you specific abilities to fly in, in specific types of airspaces. Mm. Jurisdictional is very good for if you have to deal with complex airspace Hmm. for instance if you have like an amusement park or if there's a lot of major airports in the area getting a public code could be an easier way of getting that authorization to fly in that that airspace Hmm. on the other hand a part 107 is the civil route and what basically the public safety agency says our operations are basically going to be civil operations and we're going to follow the civil rules and part 107 is a basic set of guidelines and it's pretty flexible Mm -hmm. in fact actually it's in some ways can be more flexible than a public COA. Hmm. But you have to follow certain rules there too. For instance, you actually, when you have a Part 107, you actually have to get a unmanned air, aircraft systems license. So you have to get a remote pilot's license from the FAA. Under a public COA, you don't. Hmm. You can self-certify. Now, and when I say self-certify, it's saying you define your own training program. The FAA says, yes, I approve this training program in... That's what you're. That's what you have to do. Now you could say that my training program is getting my Part One Hundred Seven license, and that may be that may be sufficient in the FAA's eyes. But Part One Hundred Seven has a you know a nice framework for you to work in. When okay. it comes to a public call, you kind of have to define that whole framework of how you're going to be safe in the national airspace with everybody else. You have to define that yourself. Okay. With Part One Hundred Seven, that's kind of already predefined. So, what would be a few pros and a few cons for both? If I'm looking to get into the Part 107, what would be some pros and what would be some things that I would need to look out for? All right. So, the pros to Part 107 is that's established framework. Mm-hmm. And one of the key things I think about is from a litigation standpoint. If you're going down the road in, of a public COA, you are basically self-certifying. You're taking all the responsibility on yourself. Hmm. So if something goes wrong, it is all on you. It doesn't matter what ATC did or air traffic control. It didn't matter what the pilot, the, the manned aircraft pilot did. The fact is that you're taking full responsibility. And this is... That's with the public COA. Okay. With Part 107, there are certain responsibilities by different parties. You as the pilot, the FAA, and even air traffic control and managing airspace. Hmm. So it's possible if there's an incident that occurred, it could legitimately be someone else's fault. So the idea is that the amount of risk exposure that you have with a Part 107 is actually less than, it, or I should say, that is always less, but it could be less or probably less mm. than what a public COA would be. Okay. Another example is with a public COA, there's this called, uh, the, if you go down the blanket COA route of a public COA, okay. there's certain limitations of, to flights. There's very similar to the Section 333 exemptions that were in the past before Part 107 um, became law. With Part 107, you actually have greater flexibilities than you had before in the past. Like, for instance, 
there is a requirement, I believe, to stay 500 feet away from people or other structures okay. with the, the, the blanket cola. I believe that exists in the blanket cola used in, in public coals as well. Hmm. Now, if you get a jurisdictional cola, then you might have more, you could very well have more freedoms. But there's a catch. It only works within your jurisdiction. Hmm. In other words, the, ba- the boundary of your town. So if you're a small community of 10,000 people, you can't fly your drone in your neighboring community when they have an auto way to mutual aid call. And that, that would be a, a downside to that public co-op. But with a Part 107, you can. Okay. Now, having those... Now, Part 107 isn't, you know, completely free either. Right. You still have to apply for waivers, you know, to be able to fly at night, to fly over people, to fly b- beyond visual line of sight. And you have to get those approved by the FAA. Hmm. But the idea is it's, it's, a, it's a structured program. And as people learn what the FAA is really looking for to meet the performance standards that the FAA wants, once people learn that, public safety agencies are going to be able to follow right in suit. So it's just a matter of time. And I think for the most part, the Part 107 is actually going to be a little bit easier to manage for most departments. Now, I'm going to flip that. A public COA has other benefits that you're probably not going to get out of a Part 107. Like? For instance... If I was a law enforcement agency, mm-hmm. and let's say I had a SWAT team, mm-hmm. and with this SWAT team, we actually were looking to fly a drone during an active shooter situation, but we wanted the lights off the aircraft. Mm. You will probably never get that authorization with Apartment 107, no matter what you do. You would actually have to give a, a public call and then you know, determine with the FAA what, what you're going to do to make that situation safe. And then, you know, both parties sign it and then, you know, exec- ex- execute that. Okay. But again, you hold a full liability if something happens. So if there's a manned aircraft and you didn't see it and it comes crashing into a drone and didn't have any lights on, guess who's going to be responsible? You are. Exactly. So it's, it's kind of a give and take. So, you know, public codes do have, you know, the benefits. That if you have very complex airspace, like I talked about, like if you had an amusement park or a lot of, like, Class B and Class C airports... A public code could be definitely an easier way to get that authorization to work within those airspaces. And they also have this ability to get an ECOA. An ECOA stands for emergency COA. And you can only get it, supposedly, if you have a public COA. I think, though, that that's what I've heard. But I've heard other folks say you could also get it if you just have a COA in general. A certificate of certificate so, of authorization. So there are many different categories for the COAs, right? There, there, there are right now for unmanned air, air systems. There's basically four different types of COAs. Well, five different types of COAs we have. We have for Part 107. There is the air airspace authorization COA. Okay. That says that if you're Part 107, you can get clearance to fly Class B, Class C airspace like O'Hare Airport, Midway, LaGuardia, mm-hmm. those types of large airports. If you had a section three through three, you had a blanket COA. Okay. And what the blanket COA says, it just had a, basically a list of authorizations that you're allowed to do, like fly no higher than 400 feet, fly during daylight hours, you know, just, just what those different rules were. Hmm. There's a blanket COA also for public agencies, and it's called a, a blanket uh, public COA. And it's the same, almost the same exact thing, same thing as, this, as your section three through three. Then for public COAs, there's also a jurisdictional one. Which basically says within your boundaries, because you have special things going on in your airspace, we're going to make extra exceptions and extra mm-hmm. rules, but you're going to have to do extra steps to make sure that the airspace is still safe. Okay. And then lastly, the fifth one is the emergency COA. And that emergency COA only says if you have an existing COA right now, but it can't meet something and there's an emergency going, there's an emergency going on, you can file for an emergency COA. Now, to my knowledge, I've been told that's only for public COAs. I've spoken to the FAA on on, on a personal note, and they kind of mentioned that it could be actually for any type of COA, hmm. but that person could have been wrong. So it's, you know, sometimes you get, like, different answers from different people sometimes. That's but, with anything. But public COAs, for sure, you might be able to get one if you have a regular COA. But if you have a Part 107, because you you don't have a COA, you're not, you're not going to get it. Hmm. So... So that's cause that's where the public COAs can actually be more beneficial. I know it probably depends on the agency, whether you're fire, police, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. But what would you recommend 
to the smaller towns. A public call? Would you? And it, it, again, it can the answer that answer can vary. Yep. But what would you recommend to maybe a town of ten thousand people? Not many. It's going to matter really on the type of missions and applications you plan to do with your drone. That's going to be okay. one um, effect. If you're gonna, the fact is, if you're going to be doing law enforcement, like SWAT type of situations where you want covert operations, you're going to have to go down the route of the public call. Okay. It's going to happen. But if you take that out and you want to go the simplest route, part 107. But there's a, the only caveat is you have to know your airspace. Okay. Like where we live, we're class G airspace. We don't have any flight restrictions within our cells, and really most of our Mavis division, or for all the mutual aid towns that are working together, we don't need a public co-op. Okay. We well, can easily get done what we need to get done with a Part 107 with okay. proper waivers, like having a night waiver, having the ability to fly over, fly over people, and then flying beyond visual line of sight. So a lot of people are getting their night waivers right now through Part 107. Hmm. If, as long as you go through the proper steps, you know, the FA will, you have to apply for it on, on their online portal. Talk about how you're going to meet those um, st- performance standards they want you to address. And as long as you can meet those performance standards, they're going to get you the night waiver. Hmm. There's been very few people right now that have been successfully able to get the flight over people um, wa- waiver, as well as beyond visual line of sight. I'm assuming, though, that over time, people are going to figure out that magic sauce of how the FA wants you to meet those performance standards Mm -hmm. where people figure it out and then public agencies just like civilian organizations will be able to to figure that out and be able kind of to say okay this is how we need to address it as that knowledge gets out there okay what about that person out there to their respective agency they just can't decide which one they want to go with which one really benefits their needs or if not man it seems like both of them benefit that department's needs is there a way to go about having both absolutely really so you can actually, you can have a public call. In fact, I, I know of one agency that's out in California that that's pretty much exactly what they're doing. They're mm-hmm. using effectively Part 107 for part of their town, and then the part of the town that's actually within Class C airspace, they're using a public COA. And they're, they're, they're doing that because the Part 107 gives them more flexibility. Mm-hmm. The public COA doesn't give them as much flexibility, but it, it allows them to facilitate you know, the various missions that they, that they can handle and that they can get. I'm hoping over time, the FAA is going to have a different flavor of a public co-op. Okay. And I don't know because I haven't spoken to anybody there, but the idea is that, or my thinking is that the Part 107 would be the basis of what your co-op is. Okay. And then what would happen is you would get a public co-op on top of your Part 107 that would deal with the specialized airspace. It's kind of like a prepackaged set of waivers and how you deal with different airspaces that would just apply to public safety so it agencies. Seems like, it seems like the air, airspace is really somewhat the determining factor of which route you want to go yeah. with this part 107 or public. So that, that airspace is c- the complexity of it. I okay. mean, if it's just class D, you have a good relationship with the airport and you're able to get a certificate of authorization from, you know, part 107 that mm-hmm. meets your needs. You, you still, you still don't need that public code. You could still do it with a part 107. Okay. Cause you can, even with a part 107, you can get clearances for, various separate airspaces, but it's when okay. it gets really complex when it's just all over the place mm-hmm. and it just, you know, the fact is the FAA just doesn't want you to say, well, for all the hair report, I just want a clearance if you're a civil operator. Yeah. They just don't want you to do that. And if you're going to say your fire department is going to run those civil operations, they're going to hold that same bar towards you as well. Because they just don't want a bunch of people saying, oh, I just wanted to fly anywhere around O'Hare Airport because it's mm. just not going to happen. Seems like this is still an ever-evolving thing as it, well. It, it is still evolving, and it is. I mean, the loss just went in August 29th, mm-hmm. so a little over, what, about two months ago. And... You know, everything's still fresh. The There's still a lot of bumps that we're all dealing with as uh, unmanned pilots. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's a step in the right direction. And that's one of the things I'm really, really super excited to... We all are. We all are. To, to see. So, from a public safety standpoint, you know, again, if, you, if you're a larger agency, you probably just want to go down a public co-op. Because you probably okay. have complex airspace, like stadiums. Yeah. Um, maybe you have to deal with TFRs to the you know, presidents are flying in and out or whatever, mm-hmm. and you want to be able to address that and be able to fly in those type of situations, then you're definitely going to have to get a public call. Because the last thing you want is the Secret Service knocking on your door. <laughs> yeah, no one wants that. Yeah, and had no one under. It's like, uh, were you flying a drone? Like, uh, maybe? Probably not. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it was that guy. He was flying the drone. But, yeah. 
it's it, it's really going to matter. And again, you need to talk with your village attorneys and kind of you know talk with your fire chief and 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 talk with you know other agencies and just try to understand what your different missions are going to be and what your needs are. And you know, there's a lot of great information on on actually in Facebook forums. There's a public uh, public safety uh, uh, drone user group that's out there. If you mm-hmm. just go search for it, uh, you'll find it. And it's you know really a lot of great uh, other mm-hmm. professionals out there that have a lot of great input. And uh, you know, I've learned a lot from it. And I think, you know, I think with all this information, you know, people can just, you know, sit back and take a little bit of time before you jump right in and make mm-hmm. that right decision. Because, you know, you can start with Part 107 like right away. Getting a public COA can take you six months, and it, the public COAs don't last forever. They have to be renewed every two years. Hmm. Part 107, the only thing you got to renew is your license, and that's up to the individual. It's a lot easier just to go in and take a refresher test, hmm. as opposed to. Public code where you gotta resubmit everything all over again, and mm. if they if they change anything, you gotta try to change your performance standards. It can be a really really painful process. So, okay. it's definitely something that you kind of have to weigh. But and we I see think development developments with it. I think most of America, since you know most of it actually is rural, not urban, yeah, or suburban for that matter. I think most, I think most part one seven would apply. Okay. I think I you know overall, again it's just those larger departments, those. Towns of over like a hundred thousand people, they probably want to you know at least look at getting a public COA. And then it's just based on maybe you are a small town, but you got a lot of activity, so maybe you would probably go with the public COA for them too. Or well, if you're a small town, you have a lot of industrial com- uh, complexes, and maybe for instance, um, like if you maybe have a military base. Okay. Definitely want to go for a public COA. Though. Okay, makes you, sense. Because again, you don't want that Air Force fighter going. Shh, poof, and there goes yeah. your drone. Yep. Because that'd be bad. So I think that does it for today. Pretty good episode. Pretty, yeah, pretty, a lot pretty of information good episode. There. A lot of information. I'm looking forward to uh, as we get into the holiday season. Yep. So I'm getting a little ready for some turkey. Got to got to start I'm preparing. Knife ready. Got to start preparing. So, with that, everyone, I'd like to thank you for watching. As always, we know you got a choice, but uh, we're very, very helpful. Very, very helpful. Don't we're forget very, to very like thankful. and subscribe. Yes. Don't forget to like our Facebook page and subscribe yep. to our YouTube channel. And you can also find this information, if you didn't find it already, on www.savinglineswithdrones.org. That's where our site's at. Or if you're just watching the YouTube channel, that's okay, too. You can just subscribe there. With that said, my name is Keenan. And I'm Dominique. And you were listening to Saving Lives with, with Drones. Drones.